the female reproductive system. Although anatomically, there's not much going on. It's kind of simple. You've got an ovary, a fallopian tube, a uterus, and a vagina, along with some details in the uterus and some stuff on the outside externally. But hormonally, there's a whole lot going on here, okay? It's not as simple as getting some testosterone, producing some sperm, or sorry, producing 750 million sperm for ejaculation and just doing it for the rest of your life. Women are not like that. <laughs> not exactly. So women have ovaries and ovaries are the female equivalent to the testes. That is the gonad in the female. Um, they will produce gametes, which in this um, case will be an ova and also hormones. So you're getting hormones from the ovary, things like progesterone, estrogen, inhibin, relaxin, all of that is coming from the ovary. Histologically, the ovary has a germinal epi epithelium covering it on the outside. It also has that tunica albuginea. Yes, exactly the same one that we saw in the males. The ovary itself has an ovarian cortex on the outside and ovarian medulla in the middle. The cortex is where we find those follicles and the medulla is where you're gonna have your blood vessels, your nerves, and your connective tissue. Okay. Ovarian follicles. Who is tired? I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> Ovarian, this should all kind of be familiar. Really, I'm going to run through it quickly because I want to focus on the cycles and the hormones. That's the most important part. Um, so, up, I mean, this stuff should be familiar from what you've done in lab. We know that there are ovarian follicles. We know that inside of those follicles are oocytes. At any given moment, um, oocytes surrounded by follicular cells and granulosa cells. At any given moment, if you took a section out of an ovary, you're going to see different stages of development of follicles. Okay. Um, sorry. And then you're going to see a mature or graphian follicle that is ready to rupture. Hopefully you have at least one that's maturing per cycle, per ovulation cycle. Who keeps trying to call me? And then you may also see a corpus luteum, which is what happens to that follicle after it has ruptured and released the oocyte. It closes back up, becomes a corpus luteum, and the corpus luteum is able to support that oocyte by secreting hormones also, progesterone, estrogen, inhibin, and relaxin. I included this picture here because I thought it was super cool to see the different ovarian follicles in different sizes. Kind of looks like a picture of the moon. And then up here has all of the different stages, starting with your primordial fi uh, follicles. Sorry. <laughs> your primary follicles, then it becomes a secondary follicle. Then you have a mature follicle. It ruptures, giving you ovulation, turns into the corpus luteum, and then degenerates and becomes the corpus albicans. So you have all of the stages right there in that one picture. Okay. So... Uh, formation of those, uh, or development of those oocytes or those gametes is called oogenesis, and it actually happens before a female is born. Before a female is born, those uh, little cells in the ovaries that are meant to become follicles and secondary oocytes will actually go begin a division of meiosis. They don't complete it, but they do begin it, and then they're arrested for a while coming. It's not coming. Okay. Nope. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. So we have primordial germ cells. These are like stem cells that are going to go um, to the ovaries and differentiate into oogonia. And then those oogonia are going to divide, leaving you germ cells, which very few of them will eventually become your primary oocytes. When it comes to the female reproductive system and something like an oocyte, the body is very, very picky, okay? It actually goes through a process of weeding through genetics, trying to find the best it can. So even though those germ cells may divide and you have like 300, maybe only 20 of those will ever become primary oocytes. Okay. So every month after puberty, you've got hormones FSH and LH. Do you remember where they come from? The pituitary. The, the hypothalamus gives you the gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and then the pituitary gives you FSH or LH, your follicle-stimulating hormone or your luteinizing hormone. So after puberty, those hormones will be released, 
And then those primordial follicles that the female was born with will begin to mature. Please note that the process of going from a primordial follicle to a mature follicle can take a very long time. It can take almost a year to develop. And so this begins at puberty. And then you start maturing several different follicles at once in the hopes that one will mature per cycle, okay? This is why like at the beginning of menstruation, which is like menarche, when a woman or a young lady begins to menstruate, it's not always regular because these hormones are still adjusting. And most likely she's not really ovulating yet in that first year because it does take time for all of this to kick in and start maturing. So um, they all begin to grow and you should have at least one reaching maturity out of the ones that all started for that ovulation, that one star that gets to be it. Okay, so what happens is you've got your primary oocyte, and then you have, here's my primary oocyte, and then you have the purple cells around it, those are your granulosa cells. Um, you'll have a glycoprotein zona pellucida between this primary oocyte and these granulosa cells, and that zona pellucida is later going to become what that outer shell is for the egg that protects it from everything around it. And then as it continues to mature, you're gonna have a secondary follicle. You'll have something out here called the theca folliculi on the outside, sort of like your guards for this follicle. Um, you'll get doo -doo 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 -doo, uh, the corona radiata will form late in this stage. Remember those are the uh, granulosa cells that are closest to the secondary oocyte. And then you will end up with a mature follicle, all right? All right, you don't have to worry about all those details. We're just walking through it. I know, it's freaking everybody out. Okay, so mature follicle. That diploid primary oocyte will complete its meiosis and give you a haploid secondary oocyte. What does that mean, diploid and haploid? Diploid is that one that they say is 2N. Haploid is N. What does that mean? Chromosomes, 46 chromosomes in a 2N, 23 chromosomes in a haploid or 1N. This is the number that I need in order to join with the 23 coming from the sperm to give me a complete set, to give me a fertilized ovum, okay? So once that follicle around is mature, then that, second, that primary oocyte turns into a secondary oocyte. Well, we just lost 23 chromosomes here, right? How did I do that? Well, I also produced something called a polar body. And notice it's called the first polar body. Somebody must be dying or something, I don't know. It's probably the blinds people. The first polar body. <laughs> The first polar body, because there may be a second polar body later on, okay? Um, hold on, you guys. Something's going on. I'm sorry. Three times they called me. Shit. I'm going to have to suck it up and just keep going. I don't know what it is. Okay. So, where was I? Diploid primary oocyte became a haploid secondary oocyte by losing 23 chromosomes to the polar body. Okay? Got it so far? Okay. Then, at ovulation, that secondary oocyte, along with the closest cells to it, the corona radiata, will be ejected and thrown out into the peritoneal cavity. Hopefully, sperm comes along, fertilizes it, and you end up with an ovum. And you may also have a second polar body, all right? I'm going to talk about polar bodies in a minute. And then that becomes a zygote and blah, blah, blah. You get a baby at the end. So right here, we began with an oogonium at 2N. This part right here, look, I want to show you something. This part right here happens in the embryo. This is before birth, okay? So as this fetus is developing in the early stages of um, 
life in a mother's womb, it goes from oogonium to primary oocyte and it stops. Notice it stops right in the middle of that first meiosis. Then everything after that happens after puberty or at puberty. So when they tell you that a woman is born with a certain number of eggs, in a sense, it is true. Yes, you are born with a certain number of primary oocytes, okay? So you've already gone through a weeding process. Then at puberty, the primary oocyte will become a secondary oocyte. When that follicle has matured around it, it's going to turn into a secondary oocyte. It loses half of the chromosomes. Notice this is 2N and this is just 1N. Half of those chromosomes that are lost are lost with the first polar body, okay? And that is a way of recycling or getting rid of junk. This is like a house cleaning. You're spring cleaning your oocyte, taking everything out that you don't want to keep that may have a mutation. It may be an extra repeat. It may be whatever. Things you don't need will go into this polar body. The polar body may be all junk and just get tossed away. Or maybe the polar body has something, some type of protein or something that we want to reuse. Then it can divide and maybe half of it will go away. The other half will be put aside just in case. Okay. Then at ovulation, you've got your secondary oocyte free in the peritoneal cavity. It meets a nice sperm. It's fertilized. It becomes an ovum. When the sperm and egg join each other, there's going to be a second polar body. Again, sperm are millions, right? We don't know what's coming in with that sperm. We might need to clean some more stuff out of the closet, right? So then when these are grouped together, they're grouped together, there's another cleaning process that goes back in and checks all of this DNA, making sure everything is just right. We don't have any extra chromosomes anywhere. We don't have any extra proteins hanging out of somewhere. Clean it all up. And that second polar body is produced at that point. Okay. Now you have your perfect little zygote with 46 chromosomes that within 40 weeks should give you the most adorable little baby ever. Cool. <laughs> they're all kind of ugly when they're born anyways. Okay, so females, um, we talked about the ovary. They also have a tube going from the peritoneal cavity to the inside of the uterus called the fallopian tube. The end of the fallopian tube is called the infundibulum. It also has these little fingers that stick out. Those are called fimbria and they kind of just hover over the ovary waiting for the oocyte to be released so they can suck it up. The widest part of this tube is called the ampulla and that's a very common site for ectopic pregnancy because it's like the little oocyte is traveling through here and then it gets to this big wide open space and says, oh, this must be the uterus. I'll set camp right here. But no, it's not the uterus, it's the fallopian tube and that's one of those instances of a common um, ectopic pregnancy site. Okay, so that was the tube. The uterus, the uterus, the top of the uterus is the fundus. The central portion is the body. And at the end, you've got the cervix. The cervix has two openings to it, one on the inside called the internal os, one on the vagina side called the external os. And this is where you want your fertilized egg to implant. On the inside of the uterine cavity, um, internal os, external os, I've already done that. We have perimetrium is my serosa that covers it. Myometrium is that thick muscular layer. It's actually three layers in the uterus. And then you have your endometrium, which was a stratum functionalis and stratum basalis. Just to remind you, stratum functionalis was the part that is shed with a menstrual cycle. Stratum basalis is the part that remains and helps feed into that functionalis as it grows. Okay, in the cervix, there are also cells that secrete a mucus. We call that the cervical mucus. And cervical mucus does actually change with the cyclic changes in a woman's body. Um, and things like pregnancy, all of that can change cervical mucus. So normally it's meant to be thick and prevent any type of bacteria from entering the uterus. As a woman reaches the stage of ovulation, it will thin out 
and be more um, hospitable to sperm, allowing them to pass through this mucousy barrier to get to the egg, right? Cool. And then at pregnancy, it'll also be super thick, closing up that opening so that nothing gets in to harm the baby. And then when it begins to dilate, right before childbirth, that mucus may actually fall out with a little bit of blood and freak women out, and it's just a mucus plug. That's, yes. <laughs> yes, don't let it freak you out. It is a physiological process. It is normal to have a little bit of mucus and blood stain, or blood stain mucus um, as the cervix begins to dilate and may lose that mucus. Okay, the vagina, huh? No, it does not mean you're going into labor. You still got a long time, especially if it's your first one. It does not, <laughs> says someone who's had to work that night shift, apparently. <laughs> All right, the vagina is fibromuscular canal. It is, um, the mucosa of it is actually continuous with the inside of the uterus. The hymen is a thin fold of membrane that partially closes the end of the vagina, the outside part here. I'm gonna go to this picture here because I wanna explain something. Most people think a hymen looks like this. Uh-uh, it does not. It may come out like that, but if it does look like that, you need to have it surgically opened up because that's impenetrable. Uh oh, most of the time, I thought I erased. Oh, most of the time a hymen will look something like this, where you have just a little bit on the edge here, right? And there should be some type of natural opening into it. Please note that there is an opening there. That means that if, this person were to have sexual intercourse, the hymen does not necessarily have to tear. So it doesn't have to be bleeding. It doesn't always happen that way. It just, it's all relative. It depends on the size of the opening, on the size of the penis, all of that, okay? And when there is bleeding, that means that the hymen has been torn. This could happen later in life. It does not have to happen at first intercourse. So all the stuff you see in the movies, all of the cultures that like wait for the bed sheets to come out after the first night um, and then kill the bride and stuff, that ain't right. Okay, just say it, because I, I watch a lot of movies, you can tell. All right, so other than that, you've got, <laughs> you've got a clitoris here that is um, also erectile tissue. Um, and then you've got the libia minora on the inside, majora on the outside. There is also tissue here on both sides in this vestibule that we call the um, bulb of the vestibule that can also engorge. It's around the opening of the vagina. They can engorge during, or should engorge during sexual arousal and that causes that opening to become tighter, gets a better grip on a male penis. And all of that is homogenous to the erectile tissue of the penis, both the bulb of the vestibule and the clitoris. Now, there are glands here also that contribute. We have the paraurethral glands and the vestibular glands. The paraurethral glands are gonna give you a mucousy um, gland that goes, um, sorry, that comes out from the wall of the urethra. The um, greater vestibular glands are going to give you a clear mucousy secretion that aids in lubrication same as the bulbourethral glands in the male, okay? Just please note that both of these are secreting, secreting a mucousy secretion, and yes, it may be a little bit more watery than it is mucousy sometimes, but at no point in time should it be shooting out three and four feet um, out, just saying. Okay, the mammary glands. Let's talk about the mammary glands. <laughs> The mammary glands are in the breast. They are actually modified pseudoriferous glands. Where is, oh, here's the word I'm looking for. They are modified pseudoriferous glands that appear um, towards uh, the last trimester of pregnancy or maybe middle of pregnancy. They appear in the breast during pregnancy. And then after birth, they have the ability to produce milk. It is divided into lobules. Um, and each lobule will have alveoli that, that produce milk. All of that milk will leave through the nipple, through those ducts. Look at that. So here's what it looks like in purple. This is all of those milk producing alveoli with ducts going through the nipple. By the way, the skin around the nipple is called the areola. 
and these are modified sweat glands. Okay. How much time do I have? I still have 15 minutes, right? Huh? 20? Okay, good. I'm almost to the part I want. Okay, so um, this is it right here. This is what it's all about, the cyclic changes that happen. And I made it all on one slide so you guys can just look at one slide and get the whole thing. So um, the entire process of, uh, you know, maturing an oocyte and ovulating and then um, the things that happen in the uterus for that to happen and the things that happen in the ovary for that to happen are all timed perfectly through hormones, okay? So the changes that happen in the ovary are called the ovarian cycle. That's the process of having a follicle mature, having a secondary oocyte, having the follicle rupture, and then having a corpus luteum. The changes in the uterus is the uterine, uterine cycle. That is the part where you shed that functionalis and then you begin rebuilding it again when you need to, okay? So we've got changes happening in ovary and uterus at the same time, and they are both controlled by hormones. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this one for now because it's really, we say it later on, but let's, all right, let's just do it. Main thing is to remember that the hypothalamus is controlling everything with the gonadotropin releasing hormone, okay? So at puberty, hypothalamus gives you gonadotropin releasing hormone, pituitary gland gives you FSH and LH, those are gonna go to the ovaries and start things in motion, okay? So let's talk about what happens in motion. Um, we have four phases of the reproductive cycle. The average cycle lasts about 28 days. We do have a range of 24 to 36 days. It goes through menstrual. Yes, it begins with the menstrual cycle, pre-ovulatory, ovulation, and then post-ovulatory. Let's look at them, okay. So I want to start up here. Again, gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Without that, we have nothing, okay? Then the pituitary gives you what? FSH and LH. FSH is your follicle stimulating hormone. So um, at puberty, it's gonna ask these follicles to begin developing. After that, it's going to find these follicles and help them mature. So you're gonna go from primary follicle, secondary follicle, to a mature follicle and then ovulation, all from, um, well, not ovulation, but all the way up to a mature follicle through FSH. But get this, notice that a secondary follicle and a mature follicle, these follicles are actually secreting estrogen, okay? All right, then you have an LH surge, which is what gives you ovulation, and then you end up with a corpus luteum. That corpus luteum also secretes hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Okay, let's look at what's happening here in the uterus at the same time. So I want you to start here with the proliferative phase. As these follicles are maturing, that estrogen coming from those follicles causes the uterus, that stratum functionalis, to increase in thickness as it goes. So the more the follicles are maturing, the more the lining of the uterus is thickening. Then you have ovulation. Once you have ovulation, you're going to have a corpus luteum. You're going to have progesterone and estrogen coming from this corpus luteum. That is going to stimulate your secretory phase in the uterus. That means that I'm going to have the glands of that stratum functionalis increasing producing lots of secretions, and I'm going to have my blood flow in here increasing. I'm adding capillaries. I'm trying to get it nice and warm and juicy for my oocyte that I'm expecting. But we know now that if that oocyte does not get fertilized and it dies, the corpus luteum is going to die too, right? So if I don't have a corpus luteum, I don't have the hormones coming out of it. That drop in hormones, especially in that progesterone, is going to cause menstruation. That's what causes the shedding of that lining. Okay, make sense so far? Cool. Okay, I want you to focus down here 
at the hormone concentrations, okay? Because this is a really good way to remember what every hormone is um, responsible for and what it does. So FSH is your follicle stimulating hormone that stays constant most of the time, right? Because that one's directed from your pituitary. So as long as the pituitary is in good health and the hypothalamus has given it the gonadotropin releasing hormone, the anterior pituitary will release FSH, follicle stimulating hormone from puberty on. Look at the estrogen. The estrogen levels will begin to rise gradually as your follicles are maturing, which totally makes sense because that's where you're getting some of this estrogen, right? It's coming from a maturing follicle. So the more a follicle matures, the more estrogen it is releasing. Okay, now estrogen has a positive feedback on LH. What does that mean? It means that the more that follicle matures, the more estrogen I have, estrogen itself will actually go back to the pituitary and egg it on. Be like, come on, come on, give us more LH. Come on, we need more LH. That's a positive feedback mechanism. This is the first time we've talked about positive feedback, but that's how it works. It means that a substance, a series of events happens releasing a substance or a cause, and that same substance goes back and increases whatever it was that caused it to happen. So when estrogen comes out of those follicles, estrogen levels rise, as estrogen rises, so does LH. Okay, because estrogen is egging that pituitary on to give it more LH. And when it does that, we get to a peak. At one point, you get to what we call an LH surge. And it is that LH surge that allows that rupture of the follicle and release of the oocyte. Cool? All right. So we've had our, L our um, LH surge. That happens. The follicle ruptures. Now we're under the control of the corpus luteum. So the corpus luteum is giving us progesterone. Notice that your progesterone levels, the red dotted line here, are actually increasing, right? They're increasing because we need this to thicken up and get ready for the oocyte that we think is going to be fertilized. So as the corpus luteum is secreting the progesterone, the lining of the stratum functionalis is increasing in glands and um, I wanna say, not circulation, glands and arteries. It's, it's increasing vascularity and glandular content, okay? Getting ready for an oocyte to be fertilized. If corpus luteum dies, this is cut off. Look what happens to your progesterone. See how it drops? That's what puts you into a menstrual cycle because now corpus luteum has died because the oocyte died. Progesterone drops. That drop in progesterone is what causes the menstrual bleeding. Make sense? All right, so this is probably the most complicated part of the entire female reproductive system, but also the most important because this is essentially everything all on one slide. And I made this slide, you're welcome. Okay, just saying, <laughs> I pieced it all together because I was like, I wanna see everything in one spot. And that's how I did it. Okay, because I think it makes it easier when you can see everything in one place. Any questions about this? No? All right, perfect. The rest of it's easy after that. Okay, so obviously we have feedback. High levels of estrogen in the last part of the pre-ovatory phase have that positive feedback that causes the LH surge, and that brings about your ovulation. Okay, and there it is in plain format for you. We've already talked about it. Look, you have your LH coming out, stimulates follicle stimulation. That follicle is giving estrogen. Estrogen goes back and stimulates more release of gonadotropin releasing hormone and LH. Cool? All right. And then here is the book's way of putting it all together. I'll leave that on you, but I'm not going to talk about it because we've already talked about it on the other one that I made. Right? Okay. Whew. Development. Just a quick word, just because I think it's super cool. We're done with all the important stuff. This is just kind of cool that I told you we all start with the same thing of Play-Doh, and then it can either become a male, um, male genitalia or female, depending on the hormones that control this in utero, okay? Pretty cool. 
And then I, there's a list here of what everything is, whether it's a male or a female, like the ovaries and the testes, the ovum, the sperm cell, the uh, clitoris, the penis. You can look at that for your own um, education if you want. I'm not even going to talk about <laughs> age and fertility. Okay, so maybe a little bit. Um, <laughs> okay, so around the age of 30 to 40, 40 yes, hormones do begin to decrease. Yes, remember, we're always picking our prime eggs every time. We're trying to pick the best one. We're trying to weed out, you know, any mistakes or anything. So the good eggs do decrease in number as you get older. And at the same time, hormone release is also affected. I'm not rushing anyone to have a child at all. I'm telling you right now. In men, they really just kind of, um, they keep producing sperm, but they may have a level of testosterone that kind of drops and that may drop some desire. There may be some dysfunctions that happen at that time. Um, around the age of 60, they may start to see benign hypertrophy of the prostate where it just enlarges for no reason. Um, and we kind of talked about that in lab. Um, and then of course, I want you to know that menarche is um, the beginning of a menstrual cycle in a female. Menopause is the end of it. And then um, in puberty, uh, females will go through menarche and males will begin to produce sperm. Um, it's funny that it's this age keeps changing, y'all. When I was in school, I think this was like a 15. It just keeps going down lower and lower. I know, it's kind of scary. And then the rest of this is all about birth control. I honestly just left it there for your knowledge. This is not something I would test you on, but I thought, you know, it's nice to have a source that you can refer to. If you're ever wondering uh, what the failure rates are or what your options are, I know I've also talked about this in lab, um, in most of my labs, but I just left it there for you to look at. Woo! Any questions? All right. I think I should find a competition for speed talking. <laughs>